This is engine performance test two, test 15 17. Engine performance two, test 15 17. Got it? And that's it. Or that's actually, I say 15 17. This is. It's covering chapters 15 through 17 in this one test here. Finally got me a new phone, Mr. Richard. That's yeah, smooth. <coughs> that other one was just about bulletproof. Now you'll be looking at it even more than you were the other one while we're in class. Yeah. All right. The sensor must be warmed and functioning before the engine management computer will go into closed loop. Which one? If there's one of the sensors, it's got to be warmed and functioning before the engine management computer will go into closed loop. Which engine management computer be PCM? Now, why is it that on some vehicles they can call the, in, the engine controller an ECM and they don't have to call it a PCM? I don't know. I don't understand it. A Duramax diesel, they call it an ECM because it's got a separate computer that controls the transmission. If it's got a separate computer that controls the transmission, they just call it the ECM. Why if it controls the transmission and the engine, the, the powertrain is defined as the engine and the transmission, right? Oh, and by extension rear. So if it controls the transmission and the engine, it's powertrain control line. Well, why do people call it the ECU? Well, because they get used to that. That's what it used to be called before OBD2 came around. And uh, they, Ford called theirs a processor. And uh, the uh, some of them call it engine control computer, like the uh, ECM was what GM called it for years and years and there's just all kinds of back when they first started putting those uh, computers on fuel injected cars like in the 1968 the Volkswagen Squareback had electronic fuel injection on it. 68? Yeah in 68 and my dad worked on those and they called it that computer the brain box. <laughs> so there's all kinds of names you can call it but the J1930 regulation that came out with OBD2 said this terms well, had to be standardized. The terms, there, Matt. the terms had to be standardized, and so they went in, they went ahead and they call it uh, the uh, powertrain control module, unless all it controls is the engine, and then they can call it the ECM. That's why they call all of these charge system components like the alternator. It's called the alternator if the engine controller controls the fuel, but if it's got a standalone voltage regulator, it's called an alternator still. I mean generator, I'm sorry. They call it the generator if the PCM controls the field. They call it the alternator if it doesn't. Uh, the people that, uh, that I was, I wrote an article one time for the 13th issue of Motor Age about alternators, and I've got that available that I usually give out when we teach in one of our electrical courses. And um, the uh, people that, um, remanufactured the alternators I was writing that article for when I was talking to those engineers on the phone I was asking about the generator slash alternator ter terminology and uh, they basically rejected that business about calling the alternator a generator they didn't like that engineers didn't like that you know. but anyway the, the voltage output of a uh, put of a zirconia oxygen sensor when the exhaust stream is lean is what Zirconia oxygen sensor is your plain old oxygen sensor that's been around forever. The one, two, three, or four wire oxygen sensor. It's got to get to 600 degrees before it starts to work. So if you've got a lean exhaust, what's the voltage? Is it low or high? Low. It's low. Now, Zero. Yeah, the, uh, the reason they're saying that was because there's other kinds of oxygen sensors too. There's titania oxygen sensors that measure the temperature of the exhaust. And uh, the old Jeep uh, 87 and 90 Cherokees used to have a titanium oxygen sensor, and it read from 1 volt to 5 volts, and 5 volts was lean, and I'm going to say 0 to 5 volts. And low voltage meant rich, and high voltage meant lean on that one, which was totally screwed up and backwards. But there's only about three year models that I knew about that had that anyway, and that was only in Jeeps um, and some of the other Renault stuff. Okay, where is sensor 1, bank 1, located on a V type engine? No, that ain't good. It's going to be, there's both A and B, because it's going to be on the same bank where cylinder one is located, and it's also going to be in the exhaust manifold. All right, look here. This right here, front of the vehicle, right? All right, there's your exhaust coming out. I'm just drawing this real generic. All right, here's your catalyst, your light off catalyst. And of course, you know, you got another catalyst that they built into this one that's behind that one. You got two catalysts. All right. Uh, where's my oxygen sensor going to be? Front of it. Where? Where's my oxygen sensor going to be? Up here. Just draw that. 
Can you draw? Yeah, it's just draw a line where it's going to be. Right, right, right there and right there and where else? Right there and right there. But there's not any that are smelling of that second one. Right. That's something you got to remember. This one right here is actually the one that they're talking about. If this is a Chevy, where's number one cylinder? If it's a V8. Right there. One, and two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is HO2S11. Because one's right here. See? All right. This is HO2S12. And this is over here is 2, 2, and that's, excuse me, 2, 1, and that's 2, 2. That's how that works. But if it's a Ford, number one's over here. And the one one's gonna be here. And, and they one, count down on one, two, three, four on each side. Uh-huh. The Ford goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <coughs> unless it's a unless it's a power stroke diesel and then it goes one, two, three, four. <laughs> That's different. Then. Yeah, it is there's no oxygen sitting there. You know, but uh the motor that I'm putting in my car mm -hmm. is it's done up just like a Chevrolet. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like 4.6 or 5.4. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, a high O2S voltage could be caused by what? Rich. Rich exhaust, yeah, if you got that. You know what your oxygen sensor voltage is supposed to look like when everything's running, right? Yep. Yeah. What is it supposed to look like? When everything's running efficiently? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's supposed to go back and forth. Rich real quick, rich quick. real quick. You're typically, if you crowd the throttle a little bit and let it run a little faster, you're going to see it switching up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, some of the vehicles that I was working on back in the uh, <coughs> 90s, early 90s, they would have what they call lean cruise mode, and they did that to try to save gas. And so what they do is the oxygen sensor would taper off and just go lean while you're driving down the road. It was programmed to do that. Everything would just start cruising really, really lean. And ever so often, just to make sure the things were okay, it would peek in there and come out of that lean cruise mode and it would start operating the oxygen sensor again. If it did that when you were tipping over a hill and it was starting to get EGR on those Ford pickup trucks, well, if you do just how to make it do it, you could get it would feel like literally like somebody ran into the back of your truck. It would go bam like that, and it scared the tar out of the people that were driving it. And uh, I actually made a recording of it with that uh, with that uh, part of that uh, yeah, SBDS machine that you hook to the car and make recordings with and all that. And uh, I uploaded that recording to the people at Ford, and see that it had already been at the Ford, another Ford dealership, and they'd replaced everything except the hood of the truck trying to fix that. And so I just took, made a recording of it doing that, sent the record. I saw what was going on, but I said that looks like something that it, that it decided to do for some reason. So when I sent that in, the people at Ford says, "You'll never fix that. Don't even try to fix it." And I said, "Well, aren't y'all going to do something about it?" And they said, "We haven't had enough complaints about it to issue a TSB or no fix for it." Most of the people don't ever feel it, but if you're on the interstate and you're driving it just right, you'll feel it every now and then. But they just didn't, at that time, they just never did anything about it. But it was pretty violent. I mean, it would, it would feel like somebody rammed you in the back, you know, like the old, the old adventure movies, bam, you know, running back of the truck. Um, hey, uh, let's see. Low O2S voltage could be caused by what? Nope, D, both B and C. A defective spark plug wire? Or lean exhaust. Remember what I told you, that oxygen sensor is not smelling gas, it's smelling air. So if you've got a misfire and spark plug, there's going to be air and gas going out there. It's not going to smell the gas, it's going to smell air and it's going to show you lean, right? That's how that works. An O2S oxygen sensor is being tested using a, a digital storage oscilloscope. A good oxygen sensor should display how many switches per second. One to five switches per second. One to five, one to five. That's what you're after. Those are cross counts, by the way. What cross GM calls them cross counts. How many times does it cross from rich to lean uh, within a given amount of time, right? Uh, PO, uh, huh? That scope that you got, you can hook that up to anything, can't you? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I ordered another one that's a pocket scope. It's four trace. Fit in your pocket. Is, yeah, it goes to fit in your pocket. It's a four four trace scope. Look at that. The four things. Look at all the ones. Really? Yeah. It's a color screen too. One hundred eighty dollars. No. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Where from? I got it from uh, buy.com. $180. Yeah, B-U-Y, or 185 or something, 189 something like that. It's, le it's, it's less than $200. And it's a pocket oscilloscope, it's a four-tray scope, and it's got a color screen, and, you, and it's little enough to carry in your pocket. Well, what about the wire? Where's the, what's the wire look like? 
Well, not like any of them. I mean, you got to hook them up in there. And, oh, okay. I mean, you know, I don't know if they're DNC or BNC or what, but they're. I mean, basically, I just saw that. And I said, I can't pass that up. I got to Yeah, the less than two hundred is one hundred ninety by the time you get taxed and everything. Well, I buy buy I can show it to you on the website. I want to see yours before I buy anymore. Yeah. Well, it's supposed to be here any day. And I also got a microscope that I could hook up to my computer. Microscope, yeah. yeah. So I have two megapixels and it magnifies things and put a big, good for teaching, you know, you got to, you know, show something that you're wanting to do. Like I hook this thing up and zoom it out here and I can solder a wire and you can actually see it where it's bigger than the whole screen where yeah. the solder's flowing into the wire and all that. That's all right, just one sweet. example. Huh? That's cool. Yeah, I know. Yeah. All right, so uh, a PO 133 DTC is being discussed. Technician A says a defective heater circuit could be the cause. Technician B says a contaminated or sensor could be the cause. Both of them. Which connectors? Yeah, both those guys could be right about that. Now, how, once again, how do you measure the heater? How do you see if the heater is good in the oxygen sensor? Uh, You're going to see that a heck of a lot, guys. You're going to see heater codes. Remember what I told you about the most hostile environment? Me and the, what, the, me and the stuff that's... Huh? I've got a code right now. You said to test the two on the sensor. I mean, on the, coming from the, the uh, both body first make sure it has voltage right mm -hmm. well first thing i want to do if i'm getting a code like that yeah. is i'm going to actually unplug the sensor the two wires that are the same color going into the sensor that's the or the like a white black whatever color some of them will be brown yeah you just hook those your meter between those two and you ought to have like you know four or five ohms something like that maybe six and if you don't have if it's wide open you're done for that with that until you put a sensor on it yeah throw a sensor at it take your sensor listen to this guys if if you've measured your sensor and you know that it's not reading when you get the new sensor out of the box, measure it too. I mean, just measure it and just see how it compares. That's how you do that, you know. And then after a little while, you'll get to where you just automatically, bam, 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 you know. And sooner or later, you'll tell your whoever your boss man is, hey, that thing's a, you know, uh, oxygen sensor, HO2S12 or whatever. Hey, and make sure you're working on the right one and you know which one it is, because you may be working on this one over here and that one over here would be the one that's bad. I had that happen to me when they first started doing this nonsense back in 94. Yeah, that's what they were doing. But anyway, uh, you know, you got to know what you're doing. Yeah, you got to know what you're doing. 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 You got to know what you're if he comes, he says, how do you know that oxygen sensor is bad? They may say that because they don't like this stuff about, you know, some, the mechanic going over and saying, it needs this. Say, how do you know it needs that? That's what they're going to ask you. So you say, well, I've measured the heater, and the heater's supposed to have three or four ohms, and it's only got none. It's wide open. Oh, really? And furthermore, I've also plugged my little light bulb in. When you crank it up, the light bulb comes also on another power again down there. That'll impress somebody <laughs> if you're able to troubleshoot, right? Okay. All right. Technician A says... Well, I'm glad my surgeon measures Michael. Yep, you got it. Technician A says an oxygen sensor produces voltage output signal based on the oxygen content of the exhaust stream. Yes. Technician B says if the exhaust has little oxygen, the voltage of the oxygen sensor will be close to zero volts. Mm -hmm. Technician A. I thought if it's got only a little bit of oxygen, it's running rich, buddy. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm thinking the wrong way. Oxygen sensor cross counts can only be determined using a scan tool. Because you know, the scan tool is what sets the time frame for that. I mean, if you knew what... They got pocket scan tools too? Uh, they do. I've got one that I've got in my Jeep. Oh, man. Yeah, it's a little bitty thing. It's only about this big. <coughs> about <that> big. <laughs> yeah, it's a little tiny thing. But now the cable, the cable is bigger than the tool. But it plugs <laughs> right in down there. But I've, I got one of those. And when my Jeep used to do that nonsense where it would skip after I parked it, four foot head gasket on it. And I'd start flashing and throw me a PO3 code out of the console, came the scan tool, plug it in, clear code, <coughs> shut that light off, put it back in the console. Take about five minutes. In 15, 20 seconds. But I mean, 60 bucks for one of those. I can, I can show you where to get one. Huh? Make an app for your cell phone, too. Huh? Make an app for your cell phone. Yeah, there's a, there's a cell phone app, but you got to have a cable to plug in. So. Yeah, but I mean, it, it works on Bluetooth, so you can get them anywhere. Yep. Carry USB to OBD2. That's what you do, man. Yeah, that's doable. You can, you can get. Uh, you know, cheap software that will plug your computer into that link if you got a laptop, you know. Yep. But at well, the same I time, cheap, I yeah. will tell you this, the more, it is 150 bucks or something, they don't cost much, but that's the kind, it's just really basic. If you get any kind of professional grade uh, software to do that, you're going to pay some heavy money for it. They've also got a scope that you can get, a Pico scope, they call it, that you can connect to a computer, but it's just a little box you can click the computer. All of a sudden, your computer's an oscilloscope. It works really smooth. But it's expensive. <laughs> I mean, it ain't cheap, you know? I mean, a computer's providing a lot of hardware already, but they charge you the credit out. But it's, it's really sharp, and it's got a beautiful display. It works smooth, and it's fast. I mean, I like it. 
Me and my buddy Thomas were putting a 4.6 on a Mustang and a 240. Mm -hmm. Gonna wire up all the OBD2 stuff mm -hmm. and buy that some software like you're talking about. But you can actually reflash the ECU and all that good stuff mm -hmm. with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, it, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, smooth. All right. Yep. Now then, um, let me see. PO 131. Wait a minute. Which of the following describes acceptable oxygen sensor cross counts? Eight. Eight to ten at 2,000 RPM. Okay, now think about this. What did we say? One to five rich to lean switches per second is good. Mm -hmm. And they're saying eight to ten at 2,000 RPM. There's cross counts. So if you take 1 to 5 and 8 to 10 and put them together, you can kind of figure out what kind of a time, fact, time frame that scan tool is using, right? I mean, you, can, you can almost calculate, you can calculate those cross counts if you can learn that. Uh, PO131 DTC is being discussed. Technician A says exhaust leak upstream of the oxygen sensor could be the cause. Uh, technician B says an extremely rich air fuel mixture could be the cause. That's technician A. Because the PO131 is lean, showing lean. That's going to make it run rich, though. You know, I got this stuff that you pay on for a gasket you now, for an exhaust gasket. Mm -hmm. $17 for it. What? For like, uh, uh, it's like freaking brush. Uh, like a brush, like a. Uh, never sees. Mm -hmm. And it, it says it withstands uh, pressures up to 1500 psi, uh, rattling vibration. And that they, there was a review. Where a guy had one exhaust to hold a turbo to the, the uh, flames, and he said he's been riding around with that stuff on there for two years now. So what you're doing is instead of an exhaust gasket, you're just painting this stuff on there. Is it thick and gummy, or I don't know, Mr. Richard. Uh, I, I thought you'd been, yeah, there. I thought you'd been using it. That's pretty sounds pretty interesting yeah. there. It's Matter of fact, on that uh, on that head that we got out here, that's got two broke off exhaust studs that go like that Honda. <laughs> I don't know if they. Drill those out for us over the machine shop or not? It'd be nice if they would. They, <laughs> you know, they, do, they do for Michael. Yeah. Well, we actually drill that uh, uh, the ones out of that other one. We can drill them out. We need to. You know, a wide band oxygen sensor was first used on Honda in what model year? I don't know. Ninety two. Ninety two. Ninety two. little Honda stuff. Oh, you see original. Yeah. Wait a minute. I skipped twelve. Didn't I? Yeah. What the heck, Richard? Don't you see? A PO 132 DTC is being discussed. Technician A says a defective HO2S could be the cause. Technician B says an HO2S signal wire short at the ground could be the cause. That's going to be a that's going to be Technician A there. Uh, you got to define those codes and everything, you know. Hey Richard. Yep. How about a guy I'm all gonna know that he uh, works with said when he was working at the Mitsubishi dealers, dealership, they didn't have like a scan tool. They just used a laptop for all those scan tools. That's what everybody does now. Just about all your dealerships. Matter of fact, the, the Ford uses what they call IDS. It's hooked to a Panasonic Tough Book. Yeah. And the uh, but the scan tool was a specialized computer. Is all it was. Yeah. And so you can take a laptop and well, see that little uh, wireless vehicle interface I got. It's a thing. It's a still sound like I just don't have a laptop out there because oh. it's too easy for people to put a laptop under their arm and walk off with it. Yeah. I don't like having a laptop sitting there on a cart. But at the same, and with all the people that are coming through here, on the other hand, uh, it's the kind of deal. The, the the one they use that Jimmy uses it at Shirley is wireless. I mean, he plugs a wireless thing up to the car and he goes over to his laptop on his toolbox. Yeah, that's, that's how cool place man And uh, every competent mechanic that's professional and serious about what they do is going to have a laptop on their toolbox. Yeah. I mean, every single one of them. And that's where their shop manual is going to be. Everything's going to be there, and they can, you know, they can do all this other stuff with it. Lamont, the guy that I've got over there working at uh, Nissan, uh, he's got a yellow toolbox. You know, go figure, yellow, bright yellow toolbox. And on it's a big old expensive thing, bigger than this thing here. And on the top of it, it's got a laptop stand that stands up off the top of the toolbox that he's got a laptop mounted on. See, so, and that's where when he's got when he's working on something, and he needs some shop manual material. He logs onto the Nissan website and he goes to the you know page that he's looking for and he gets his information there. It's pretty much paperless, yeah. you know. And that's what I that's the reason I'm putting computers all over the shop so you guys can work out of the computer and you don't have to print something because that that wastes all kinds of you know paper and everything. All right, so that's '92 is when we had that and wideband oxygen sensors capable of detecting air fuel mixture in the exhaust from what? Ten to one to twenty three to one. It actually can measure a heck of a lot wider when they say wider. Huh? It can now. I know that because I got one that measures down to like nine. I mean, to seven point two. Yeah. To to twenty nine. Yeah. 
hit the ass wider. I mean, the wide bands were, were measuring a lot wider range of. See, the, the a regular oxygen sensor, it's just measuring a very narrow range of mixtures. And if it goes off the end of the scale, you know, the fuel trims have to fix that too. On these right here, it's measuring, it can measure from way down lean to way up rich. And so I don't know exactly what it is. It's like it, you don't want it going off the scale. See, the other one has got such a narrow scale right here. And I don't know what these mixtures are, but I know that zero is, you know, 14.7 to 1. It ain't going far above and below 14.7 to 1 before it runs off the scale. Right. Well, that one there, it's like you've got a scale that's like this. <laughs> and it can be way up or way low. That's what the wideband is all about. Um, a wideband oxygen <coughs> sensor and a conventional zirconia sensor can be made with cup and planar. Does that? That's deep. That's well, I tell you what, I'm going to task you with tracking that down. Uh, What's planar then? Let's type in planar oxygen sensor and educate us. We'll see how fast that Wes can find that on his smartphone. He got a new phone, he's all excited. What band oxygen, what wide, a wide band oxygen sensor can be made using what design? You got to check out the text messages. Dual cell and single cell. <laughs> Dual cell and single cell. A wide band oxygen sensor heater can draw how much current? Eight to ten amps. Got to go to like fifteen hundred degrees, you know, before it starts to work. Well, it says fourteen hundred on the next question. A wideband oxygen sensor needs to be heated to fourteen hundred degrees Fahrenheit. The old ones had to be six hundred degrees. The zirconia ones. The two internal chambers of a dual cell wideband oxygen sensor are air reference and diffusion. Now, if you get in your book, guys, you'll you'll know this stuff. You got to be reading them things, just knowing the words. You know, get ready for your final to smack you around, you know, if you haven't been reading the book. When the exhaust is rich, the PCM applies a what kind of current to the pump cell? Negative. Negative current to the pump cell. When the exhaust is lean, it applies a positive current to the pump cell. I want you guys to study up on those things now. A dual cell wideband oxygen sensor can be tested using either a scope, a scan tool, or a voltmeter. You can test any of them. All the above. Um, and in some hybrid electric vehicles, the wideband oxygen sensor can cause the PCM to enter closed loop as soon as the engine starts. And the engine being the internal combustion engine, which is ice. Right. Yeah. A conventional oxygen sensor has a reading of 900 millivolts on a multimeter. That means what? What's 900 millivolts? How close to a volt is that? Yeah, it's nine tenths of a volt. That's right. So what does that mean? Look at your look at your choices. Like you Vacuum leak, lean exhaust, rich exhaust, rich exhaust? Huh? Rich exhaust, yeah. Quite west. Looks like a planar is just a normal oxygen Yeah. Amazing. Hmm. Look at there. How, what's it telling you? What's the verbiage you got on there? There's a whole one of them. It's like a whole ride up there. Is that good? And how does it how does do you see anything that raises a red flag in your mind there or what? I don't know, it's, it's just called they just say plan off oxygen system. Yeah. That's almost like they're saying plain old oxygen sensor. <laughs> All right. A conventional oxygen sensor keeps the uh, heater keeps the sensor at about 600 degrees. I told you that earlier. One advantage of a planar type oxygen sensor is faster light off time. We'll look at that one. <laughs> when the air fuel ratio is expressed as lambda, lambda. Remember this. Uh, a lambda. <laughs> oh, that's a Greek letter. Uh, or Latin letters. Or, or yeah, a lambda number uh, of less than one indicates what kind of exhaust. Oh, now listen to this. Now we're getting to lambda, right? It's a circle with an upside down line. Well, if you've got uh, the lambda number is what you're going to see on your scan tool, guys. It's important you understand that. So excessively high. Huh? If actually, if the lambda number is less than one, see they're actually rescaling this. They're saying if the lambda number is one, it's perfect. If the lambda number is less than one, it's rich. If it's more than one, it's clean, see? So the answer's rich. Yeah, the yeah, answer's rich. So technician A says a wideband oxygen sensor, also called a lean air fuel, can detect air fuel ratios from as rich as 10 to 1 to 23. We see a lot of that earlier in a question. That's beating a dead horse. Technician B says the oxygen sensor signal determines fuel trim, which is used to tailor the air fuel mixture for the catalytic converter. That's B, A, and B. Well, I mean, it's both of them C, and you know, it's the answer on that one. On a poorly running engine, the wideband oxygen sensor can be quickly checked by disconnecting the sensor connector. 
Tell you what I did uh, when I was uh, working at Ford over there, I got this. I remembered something I learned in General Motors School under Ellen Smith, which was really cool. And she said that, uh, she had said, if you suspect that your oxygen sensor is giving bad information and it's causing your engine to run one way or another, right? Okay, so let's say that your oxygen sensor is giving no information at all, but it's in closed loop and it's causing it to run rich. Then she says, unplug the oxygen sensor and grab a hold of the, you know, hook up something to the terminal on the oxygen sensor that on the harness that hooks to it. This is the wire that's going back to the computer. Hold that in your fingers and reach over here. I always lick my fingers and just touch your hand on the battery. Start tapping your hand on the battery. And if it cleans up and it starts running all right, you'll know that you're actually acting like an oxygen yeah. sensor. <laughs> See what I mean? And I, I fixed a Dodge like that one time. I just, I remembered what she told me. I had this Dodge that came into the plant at Ford Blaze, and I didn't have books on Dodges, but it was running rich. And I said, well, let me try this. So I unplugged that, and I tapped that, tap, 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 tap. You know, How did you get to it? It was not that hard on that one. It was down there where it was easy to get to. You know? <laughs> now, some of them are just in your face, yeah. and some of them are just are buried in a curled up pipe back over here. Where you're, if they're hot, you won't get to them. You know, my, this kind of thing. My oxygen sensor is dead right in front of my engine. Yeah, it just sticks out in your face on some yeah, of the cars. Yeah, right there. Pretty handy. Now, I will tell you that. That doesn't mean it'll be easy to change, though. Some of them try to bring the threads with them when you screw them out. <laughs> I've had that happen before. It's just really irritating because you're used to, well, routine job, I'm going to replace the oxygen sensor. You go to break it loose and it won't move. You work really hard on it, it won't move. You work, 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 work. Finally, whenever it does screw out, all of the threads come out of there or it is, it is, it's galled in there and wipes the threads out. Because somebody at some point screwed it out, put it back in without any NEC's compound on it, well, and it got, it got galled. You know. But you put some you put some anti-seize on that thing when you put it back just in. A little bit, not much. Yeah, you don't have to put a whole lot on there. And basically, it just creates a you know a barrier there that keeps that metal from turning into one piece. Um, if the lambda value is 0.98, that means what? Both B and C air fuel mixture is within two percent of stoichiometry and is slightly rich. The stoichiometry is actually uh, like one. See, a, a stoichiometry is be the 14.7 to 1 air fuel ratio. That's 1. I mean, an even 1. 1 1.0. Okay, so if it goes below that, it's rich. If it goes above that, and you're going to see lambda numbers on your screen tool on some of these engines, some of these newer cars. Base pulp width is determined by what? It is not coming from the O2 sensor. Base pulse width is not coming from the O2 Where sensor. It it's coming from engine coolant, intake air temperature sensor, <laughs> mass airflow, you know, the other things like that. And, uh, well, the engine, you know, the frequency of the injector firing comes from the speed of the engine. And the pulse width comes from, is modified, the pulse width is modified by uh, coolant and uh, air temperature and airflow and density and all kinds of stuff like that. Let's get 30 or 31. Uh, is that good? Right. A conventional oxygen sensor, 30, uh, th number, question number 30 says a conventional oxygen sensor uses about uh, 0.8 to 2 amps. Now that's the heater, I'm sorry, oxygen sensor heater, not the oxygen sensor. It uses 0.8 to 2 amps, and if the air fuel ratio is 14.7 to 1, the lambda value is 1. The lambda value is 1. Whenever I ask you questions about lambda values, or if anybody does, don't don't reply. Give me the deer in the headlights look because I've hammered on that in this session and you should be able to remember it. What, I'm always gonna say what is not true about short fuel trim? Exactly. It cannot add or subtract a large amount of fuel. It just can't. Lar long fuel trim can subtract a large large amount of fuel. Uh, remember about the fuel trim numbers. If the fuel trim, if the fuel trim goes all the way, like if the fuel trim goes all the way up and hits the top yeah, yeah, yeah. of what it can do, <laughs> then the long fuel trim kicks in, and it's like a course adjustment. And the short fuel trim winds up. The long fuel trim keeps correcting until it's able to bring the short fuel trim back to zero. And when the short fuel trim's at zero, if you go in there and you got a problem, you're looking at your scan tool, you don't pay any attention to the short fuel trim unless you just pull the battery terminal. If, the, if they've been driving a car from Columbus, Georgia, and they got issues with something, you plug it in. I'm looking at the long fuel trim before I look at anything else. If the long fuel trim's way off out of line, then we got an issue. All right. 
always take the battery terminal off when you're doing this stuff after you've got you your codes down so it'll forget all of the trash that's in the memory and everything. Do your repairs, clean your throttle body. It's important to do that just about every time if you've had a battery cable off. And make whatever other repair you're talking about making so that it will start out with short fuel trim and long fuel trim will zero. Hook that battery cable back up, fire it up. Watch that short fuel trim. As soon as it closes loop, if it pretty well stays close to zero, you fix that car. If you crank it up and that short fuel trim starts cranking off toward MacDuff's, you ain't done. You just start right then looking for another problem. You may have fixed the vacuum leak, you may have fixed the legitimate problem, but you didn't fix it all if that fuel trim is going off. And remember, on the ones that use a MAP sensor, any kind of a barometric pressure reading that comes in there, it's skewed, it makes it the vehicle think the vehicle's at high altitude, will cause the fuel trim numbers to be out of balance. Because what happens there is, it says, okay, I'm at high altitude, I'm going to set my air fuel mixture for high altitude. What's it doing? It's making it leaner, because it doesn't need as much fuel and there's not as much air, right? So it sets it leaner, and now the oxygen sensor is saying, hey, what are you doing up there? We're lean down here. <laughs> and it says, my gosh, I didn't know they were lean down there. I don't know why they're lean, but we need to fix this. So it starts going click, 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 click. And it says, man, I'm all the way at the top of my short fuel trim, and I can't get it to go any richer. Okay, it's time to do the course adjustment. Click, 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 and then the long fuel trim. Okay, now we're seeing some oxygen sensor switching. Okay, Joe Mechanic comes and plugs in and says, why does Sam Hill does it have the long fuel trim at 28%? Oxygen sensor, short fuel trim. Oxygen sensor switching beautifully. Short fuel trim's at zero. Long fuel trim's got everything tilted way out of line so that it can, and so he says, you know, I must, if any smoke test the intake manifold to see if there's any smoke, you know, any vacuum leaks, like remember the smoke test? We smoke test the intake, no vacuum leaks there. Then we start looking, my gosh, look at that. This thing's telling us we're at 4,000 feet. And that means it's actually running lean because it's putting less fuel in there because the calculation that it uses to determine, you know, its base is fouled up. So it needs to have accurate barometric pressure readings or it's not going to do what's right. But anyway, your oxygen sensor is going to cause the fuel trims to go wacky if it reads anything wrong for any reason, you see. If it's an in-range failure of the barometric pressure sensor, the PCM doesn't know anything except to believe it. It has no rationality check for that. You know, unless it had two barometric pressure sensors and it could measure it with this sensor and that sensor and one of them was not matching the other one. Okay. That's what a rationality check is. I'm going to look at this, I'm going to look at that. They should match if they don't. One of them's wrong. That's what the, I mean, that's what the PCM does on some of this rationality check. Okay, uh, let's see. Fuel trim provides a method that's capable of changing the amount of fuel delivered to the engine based on feedback from which of these sensors, oxygen sensors, blah, blah, blah. Technician A says the primary purpose of fuel trim is to keep air fuel mixture as close to 14.7 to 1 as possible. That's where it's the cleanest burn. That's where it gives us our carbon dioxide, which is what we want. We want our cars to be breathing out the same thing we breathe out. We breathe out water vapor and carbon dioxide. And if our car is breathing out water vapor and carbon dioxide, we're okay. Nothing wrong with that. And uh, you know, if we, when you go back to school over there, you know, you can say, Look, you take a, tell your teacher when they're starting to talk about climate change and stuff, look, if you take 100,000 molecules of atmosphere and you find out, I'm going to measure this 100,000 molecules of atmosphere, just a sample that you're going to take, an average sample, 35 of those 100,000 molecules is carbon dioxide, right? 35 out of 100,000. Of that 35 molecules, one of those molecules is man-made. Did you hear what I just said? One of those, those 100,000 molecules is a man-made carbon dioxide molecule. Is that a problem? No, it is not. They can stick that in their ear. If the plants, <laughs> if the plants could hear us talking about how we were going to cut off their air supply, the trees would be reaching in here with their limbs to jerk us up by the throat. Because the tree says, we need carbon dioxide. Stop taking it away from us. There is no problem. Besides that, the atomic weight of carbon dioxide is what? 44. If the atomic weight of oxygen and nitrogen is like 14 and 16, where is the carbon dioxide going to go? It's going to stay low to the ground where the plants can breathe it. You got what I'm saying? It ain't going up there. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to go up there and cause problems. Don't, don't start with me. They're even trying to say the EPA says water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Well, what is it? Shoot the clouds and make them come down? You know what I'm saying? Be real. I get so ill with these people, and a lot of people just buy into this stuff and they believe what they're doing. It's stupid. Why yeah, it's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. Water vapor is a 
Water, yeah, water vapor, yeah. I'm breathing out water vapor. You should better stop that. <laughs> All right. Technician A says the primary purpose of fuel trim is to keep the air fuel mixture as close to 14.71 as possible. For Technician B says the air fuel ratio is at 14.71. The efficiency of the catalytic converter is the lowest. No, that's wrong. Hey, Technician A, he's right. Close to 14.71 as possible. Technician A says air fuel ratio lambda numbers lower than 10 indicate a lean mixture. He's wrong. It's rich. Technician B says air fuel ratio lambda higher than 10. Both those guys are wrong. That's, I don't know why they put a question there. So do it. <laughs> Neither one of those guys know what they're talking about. To determine the air fuel ratio, if lambda is given, multiply the lambda times 14.7. You got that? 14.7. You multiply it times 14. That ain't hard to remember, is it? 14.7. Okay. The equivalence ratio is what? The inverse of lambda. That means it's the opposite, right? So it's the ad, admolimal. Uh, lambda of 0.97 means the engine is running at 14.3. Got it? All right. So what was See, if you multiply, if you multiply 0.97 times 14.7, you're going to get 14.3, right? Got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that. Okay. All right, let's see how quickly we can uh, get this. <laughs> that concludes uh, chapter 15 through 17.